There is a lot of contradicting information when it comes to soy. So on the one hand, we know that there are countries in Asia where they have been consuming soy for centuries and they have stellar health. In fact, for many decades, we were told that women in countries like Japan have lower incidence of hormonal imbalance symptoms like hot flashes precisely because they consume a lot of soy. But on the flip side, there is also some research suggesting or even showing that soy can be estrogenic and it can contribute to chronic conditions like cancer. So it begs the question, what's really going on? Is it the soy or is there something else that we are not looking at? Well, in this video, I am going to give you my perspective on this. I'm going to share some research that I have come across recently, and I'm going to give you five things that most people tend to ignore in discussions about soy. But before we dive in, I just want to say hello and welcome. I am Jermaine from livewellzone.com. I'm an integrative nutrition health coach and a yoga teacher who helps women to balance their hormones naturally and confidently. Okay, so back to soy. Now, soy is basically just a bean. The actual plant is soybean. It is part of the legume family and it contains phytoestrogens that are known as isoflavones. As far as the research shows, currently soy is the most concentrated uh, source of isoflavones in nature. Now, I should point out here that even though soy is usually talked about as a very phytoestrogen rich food, there are other foods out there that also contain phytoestrogens. Okay, there's other fruits and veggies and nuts and seeds and grains that have some amount of phytoestrogen. So we're talking about things like chickpeas, for example, and peanuts. Uh, and then there's also like flax seeds. Now the type of phytoestrogen that you find in flaxseed is called lignans, which is different from the isoflavones that are in soy. By the end of the day, they're all plant-based estrogens. And the thing that is very interesting about phytoestrogens is that more and more research is showing that they can be either estrogenic or anti-estrogenic. And this is really where the confusion starts to happen for a lot of us. So here are two examples of how phytoestrogens can actually be anti-estrogenic. So in the book, Botanical Medicine for Women's Health, there is a discussion about the use of red clover during perimenopause. Now, red clover is an herb that is rich in phytoestrogens. It has the same phytoestrogens that we find in soy. And during perimenopause, estrogen levels tend to be elevated. Now, what's interesting is that according to the information in that book, when we have elevated estrogen and then we consume phytoestrogens, those phytoestrogens bind to our estrogen receptors. And what that does is it sends a signal to your brain to basically not produce as much estrogen. So it actually will dial down the production of estrogen. And that's how an herb like red clover seems to be quite beneficial for a lot of women during perimenopause. Another example is flax seeds. So flax seeds contain a different type of uh, phytoestrogen. Those are known as lignans. And there is some pretty solid research showing that flax seeds are beneficial when it comes to reducing tumor growth in breast cancer as well as prostate cancer. So going back to our original question, why is it that populations in Asia mostly seem to do very well eating a lot of soy while here in the US, we seem to have a lot more negative outcomes from consuming that same food. Where well, here are the five things that might be possible reasons. So the first major clue might lie in the health of the gut. Now, when we eat soy, our gut bacteria is responsible for breaking down those phytoestrogens into different byproducts. And one of the most important byproducts is something called equal. Equal seems to be the, uh, the byproduct of soy digestion that actually is most antioxidant and provides the most health benefits. But here's the thing, not everybody has the bacteria in their gut to make equal. So there is some research showing that uh, anywhere from 40 to 70% of Japanese people are able to make equal. Whereas here in the US, it's only about 20 to 30% of the population that is able to do that. So 
Again, that seems to be really the hook. And if you can't make equal, then you don't get those positive antioxidant benefits of that compound. And which means you can actually end up experiencing a whole bunch of negative effects simply because uh, you ate soy and you don't have the ability, you don't have the bacteria in your gut to break it down and to convert it. Now, another reason why Asian populations might be doing better with soy as opposed to those of us here in the US is microbiome diversity, okay? So again, there is research showing that people in Asia have way more diverse uh, colonies of bacteria in their gut compared to here in the US. And a lot of it has to do with the foods that they're consuming as well as their overall lifestyle, okay? Now, case in point, uh, there's another study, some other research showing that when people move from Asia and come to the US and start eating more of an American diet and start living more of the American lifestyle, their gut diversity uh, basically goes down, okay? So it starts to match uh, basically their environment. And what the studies are speculating here is that a lot of it is not just food related, it's also environmental. So maybe they move to the US and there's also a lot more stress in their lives, maybe there's less physical activity. A lot of different things affect uh, our gut and all types of stress, whether it's food, whether it's emotional or any other type of stress will indeed affect the gut. So there's probably another reason why we might be having a hard time here in the, the US when it comes to breaking down soy and actually getting benefits from it. Now, the third thing we're gonna talk about is food diversity, okay? So as much as we talk about the fact that a lot of soy is eaten in Asian countries, the truth is they eat a lot more than just soy. So it could very well be that again, the health benefits or the, the health outcomes that they have are not strictly related to soy. It could be the fact that they eat a lot of seaweed or that they consume a lot of green tea, or it could be the fact that they also eat a, and a lot of medicinal mushrooms and they make teas out of those medicinal mushrooms. They eat a lot of fermented foods. They eat a lot more fish and a lot less red meat. There's a lot more veggies in their diet. There are different types of legumes, things like mung beans, for example. There's a lot more going on in their diets than just soy. And if you look at that diet, there's going to be a lot more prebiotics that are coming into their diet, which is then going to help when it comes to uh, growing the right probiotics that are necessary for breaking down soy or any other food, okay? So the main uh, thing that I want you to remember here is that it may not even have anything to do with soy necessarily. It's probably has to do with the fact that they have that rainbow diet that provides a lot of different nutrients. The more variety in your diet, the easier it is to have a healthy gut. Now, the fourth thing to consider here is the type of soy that we are consuming. So here in the US, we eat mainly unfermented soy, whereas in Asia, they eat mostly fermented soy and this can make a whole world of difference okay because for one when we ferment foods it's much easier for the body to break down and absorb that also it also increases the bioavailability of the nutrients that are in that food and there's also one piece of interesting research that i came across that showed that uh, there's a type of fermented tofu known as stinky tofu which is available in countries like Taiwan, for example, and stinky tofu actually contains equal. So equal, again, that is that byproduct of the digestion of, uh, of soy that I mentioned earlier. So apparently, based on that research, if you ferment soy, basically that will pre-digest it for us so that we don't even have to worry about whether or not we have that gut bacteria or not. So that could be potentially, again, another reason why the fermented soy products seem to be more beneficial compared to the unfermented soy products. Now, the fifth and final thing we're gonna look at is farming methods. So at least 93% of the soy that is sold here in the US is genetically modified. And a lot of other countries have a lot more restrictions when it comes to genetic modification as well as when it comes to the use of pesticides. Now, the reason why this GMO soy can be so problematic is because basically, 
the genetically modified soy plant was designed to be resistant to pesticides. So what that means is you can spray that plant with a lot more pesticides than you could a non-GMO soy plant. So which means you end up with a lot more pesticide residue on that GMO plant. Now the issue here is of course, Pesticides are xenoestrogens. These are artificial estrogens and they definitely, definitely will create a lot of hormone disruption in the body. And in addition, pesticides also are just horrible for gut health. So they completely uh, mess with the balance of our bacteria. They can uh, lead to, to leaky gut and other digestive issues. So once again, this we're going full circle. If we don't have a healthy gut, we don't have the right bacteria, then that can make it even more difficult to produce those healthy uh, phytoestrogen met metabolites that we can then benefit from. So to sum up, is soy good or bad for you? Well, my honest opinion here is that it really depends on the health of your gut as well as the type of soy that you are consuming. Now, to keep things simple, I usually like to just go with what's already been shown to work and what's been shown to work for centuries is consuming fermented soy. So that means things like miso, tempeh, and natto. If you can get your hands on those, those are great. If you can also get your hands on uh, any kind of fermented tofu, that will also be, be better. And in addition, you wanna be mindful when it comes to foods that contain soy extracts. So I'm talking about here like soy burgers or soy sausages, for example, because again, um, in Asia, those are not really the types of soy. Soy is always eaten in the whole form with all components intact, not just um, bits and pieces that have been extracted. So you wanna be careful about that because that could potentially also be having some negative effects if you're eating um, foods that are very high in soy extracts. And that includes even like packaged foods, right? So there's different cookies and other things that might have some sort of soy extract in there. You wanna be careful when it comes to those. And then last but not least, don't forget about maintaining a rainbow diet because at the end of the day, whether you're eating soy or not, you still need a solid, healthy gut flora. And the only way you do that is with having a really uh, diverse diet. So lots of fiber rich foods, uh, lots of plant-based foods. Doesn't mean you have to ditch all animal foods, but you need to basically tip the scales and right so that you have more of those plant-based foods the leafy greens the cruciferous vegetables uh, the different types of beans that are out there fruits nuts seeds all of those they provide uh, prebiotics that your body can then use to make those probiotics that are helpful and protective that will ultimately help to balance your hormones now if you need help figuring out how to use fermented foods like tempeh in your meals, then you can go grab my 28 day hormone balance jumpstart. Okay. So that is a 28 day guide that walks you through all the different steps that you need to help you build those healthy eating habits that will support your hormones. And it comes with lots of different recipes and some of them even use uh, some of these fermented foods we've talked about like tempeh so you can see exactly how you can put together delicious meals that incorporate these items into them so I will make sure to place a link to that 28 day hormone balance jumpstart uh, below in the description you can grab a copy for yourself all right so those are my thoughts on soy and hormone balance and overall health now, if you have any questions or feedback about this video, I'd love to hear your opinions because I know that this topic is usually very confusing, very frustrating, and very overwhelming. I do hope that this video helped to shed uh, some light on aspects that not too many people uh, tend to talk about. So again, if you have comments or questions, leave them below. If you enjoyed the video, if you've got value from it, please make sure to give it a like. Also share it with other people that would benefit from this information and thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.